Father, we thank you again for another good day. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness to us and your goodness to us. Lord, we, Lord, we, we pray today, Lord, and we ask, Lord, as we have asked so many times, and Lord, earnestly desire that, Lord, you would be present here today, and that, Lord, we might sense the presence of God, that when we leave today, we'll say that it's been good to have been in the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said, let us go, but it was good that we went. So, Lord, I pray you'll bless today, bless each one of the folks who are here. Lord, I, I pray, Lord, for every single person here today, Lord, that you will meet the need of their heart. Lord, I know, I know that everybody carries burdens. I know we're not supposed to. But Lord, we pray this morning that you'll meet the need of our heart today, meet the need of everyone's heart today. Lord, help us to make some sense out of the Word of God today. Give us clearness of thought. Give us direction, we pray. Um, Lord, open thou our eyes that we may behold some wondrous thing today. Lord, again, we pray, Lord, for, um, I pray for Jean today. Uh, Lord, in kind of the sudden passing of, of Lee, Lord, I kind of, I, I know he was old. But still kind of unexpected, but Lord, we just, we, uh, we pray for all those people who closely affected and knew him. Now again, Lord, we pray, Lord, of course, there's so many people, Lord, that we know uh, with cancer. And Lord, we pray for them. Lord, I, I continue to pray for them, that God, you would do a miraculous thing. Pray especially for Audrey today, Lord. Do miraculous work. I pray for uh, Mrs. Tankersley in Georgia today, Lord. I, I know that she is suffering, Lord, from the treatments that they give her. And so, Lord, we do lift her up to you today. Now, Father, again, I pray you'll open your word to us. Help us, Lord, as we try to rightly divide it. Lord, as we read it. And, Lord, we'll thank and praise you for it in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen and amen. Okay. I'll give you a chance to ask a question in just a minute. <clears throat> if you have a question, if not, we'll go on in Romans. Uh, I just want to say this. Um, look, look at Romans uh, for just a moment. Chapter 3. Romans 3. And, ah, uh, there they are. The old glasses. Romans chapter 3. And they're wedged in my, I got them. There we go. Romans 3, Paul, Paul, most of what is in Romans 3, or, or, or a portion of it anyway, is taken from the Old Testament. But notice, we, we went over this uh, when we were in chapter 3, verse 10. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. And he affirms that no, not one. The verse 18, and you can read the other ones. They're all good. But verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Uh, I just want to make a comment really quickly about people say, people ask. People ask questions. Why, why would somebody walk into Walmart and shoot 22 people? They didn't even know. Now, I could see shooting somebody you knew that, you know, they did you wrong. But why would somebody walk in and, and shoot 22 people? And, of course, immediately the liberals and the progressives and communists, they immediately say, well, it's, it's guns. Guns are the problem. Guns are not the problem. The heart is the problem. See, uh, um, until somebody's heart is changed, you're not going to change. And in America, we live in a, we live in a, we, we are not a Christian nation. If we were a Christian nation, we long since passed from that. Uh, we have tried to get rid of God and, and, and unless there's an emergency then, uh, 
you know, let's sing God bless America, maybe God will bless America, but uh, we, we've long since passed from that church is closed. I read the statistic one time, and I, I found it hard to believe how many churches close every month in America. I, I've, I know that church is open. I'm not saying that there aren't new churches that are open, but how many churches closed in America? I don't know whether I often heard this said. I probably shouldn't say it, but I'll say it anyway. But in, in the 1800s, it was said the Methodists opened the church a day. Now they close the church a day. They just, we live in, a, in a, a society, we live in a culture. We live in a culture that is against God. There's no fear of God. Uh, if you ask somebody, well, aren't you worried about when you, uh, I'm not worried about if I stand before God. And so people say, well, why do people do those kind of things, preacher? Because there is no fear of God, because their heart is not right with God, and I, I believe this about men. I believe that men are totally depraved. I didn't say they were totally unable, but I do believe that men are totally depraved and that there is none good, no, not one. I didn't say they were unable to come to God, but I'm saying that men are totally depraved, that there is none that do it. There is no fear of God, that they don't care. And when you, when you stop to think about this, you know, long ago they took the Ten Commandments out, and the reasoning behind the Supreme Court ruling on that was that somebody might read the Ten Commandments and decide to obey them. Well, wouldn't that be a shame? Uh, but so we, we live in a society that is anti God, that is anti church. If Jesus does not come soon, I, I perceive that God has granted us a reprieve, whether you like the president or not. I believe that God has granted us a reprieve and that the next Democrat that comes into power, and surely they will, uh, that eventually I believe that we can expect persecution of the church. We already see it. Uh, you know, they're suing Christians right and left because we don't want to uh, bow to their culture. Uh, Mrs. Clinton said that Christians need to change their thinking on abortion. Now, I'm not going to do that. Uh, so, uh, you know, that thing, what, what are wrong, what's wrong with people, preacher? Their heart's not right with God. That's why they do it. Uh, they, they, they simply do. So, All right, does anybody else have a question about anything else today? If you do, again, the only dumb question is the one that is not asked. Anybody got a question? Okay. A you got a statement. Go ahead. Uh, a little girl that Ember hangs around with, she's 16 years old. Ember invited her to Bible vacation Bible school, and what she said was, I don't believe in anything. I just thought that was kind of odd. There was, there was a kid on my bus. I didn't bring it up. I don't ever bring religion up. If they ask me a question, then I'll answer them. Well, this kid's in the fifth grade, and he was on the bus, and some, somehow or other, they always find out I'm a preacher. They always, you know, they find out. But, uh, oh, thank you, Ryan. No, 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 absolutely not. I, I've, said, I've said many times that, you know, the greatest, the, the, one of the greatest things that happens to me is like Morgan will come by my bus, Morgan Kogut, and Marin does sometimes, but Morgan will come by. And if you know anything about Morgan, she's very outgoing. She likes to, she always gets on the front steps and says, hey, preacher, how you doing? You know, and the kids all in, you know, but, but anyway, this kid was on my bus. And um, I don't even know how it came up. But he just, in fifth grade, he said, I don't believe there is a God. Well, I, just, I just looked at him, well, that's a shame. You know, I didn't, I'm not going to argue with a fifth, fifth grader. And, but, you know, that statement, yeah. I don't believe in anything. Yeah. And, and they don't. 
I mean, they. It's kind of a sad family. Yeah. yeah. You're right, BJ. It's funny because I just said this in the conversation last night that a lot of the things that some of these kids are saying, they're actually getting these statements from somebody that they heard it from. Right. They're carrying on what they're hearing in the home. They're carrying on what they hear dad say. They're carrying on what they hear grandpa say. And they're repeating it. And mm -hmm. then because they're repeating it, they're also believing the same thing. And what you said is true because he said, my father said there isn't any God and I don't believe there's a God. That's what he told me. However, he actually came to church here. I don't, I don't know who brought him, but he actually came to church here one Sunday. So anyway, anybody else? Question, comment about anything? Okay. Very good. But it is when, when we were in school, some of us, when we were in school, uh, they, they read the Bible. How many went to school and they read the Bible in school? Yeah, yeah. Now, now, huh? Yes, absolutely, they prayed too. Literature? Right. Okay, you have a question? Okay, go ahead. We have an old Pilgrim Progress and it was a school edition. Right. And when we took praying and Bible reading out of school, so then we, we raised the generation without it. Now, since 1963, so that's been 40 years, there have been a couple generations, and the generation that was raised without it, now they have kids <laughs> and grandkids, and that's what they learned. BJ? Too late. Um, this past week, I was witnessing to a friend, yeah. and I was trying to uh, trying to get him to understand what um, you know the, the misconceptions that people have about hell. Right. And uh, one thing I told him is I've heard a lot of people you know joke about oh well I'm going to go to hell and I'm going to party with my friends. Oh I'm just going to go down to hell with all the other you know with all the rest right. of the people like me. And I was trying to figure out how to describe you know what hell is so I, de I described to him what i feel it's like but unfortunately he, the way he took that he goes oh so it's different for everybody so how can i you know where is there something that i can that, that i can provide to someone that, that describes what hell is all right Are you fixing your hair or are you trying to answer the question? Oh, okay, all right. All right. Um, all right, so, hell. You know, I, okay, so I believe the Bible, uh, and I believe that in, in Luke 16, Jesus said there was a certain rich man that fared sumptuously. Uh, and there was a guy named Lazarus. Now, I know guys, I know guys who do not believe that that is true. Uh, they believe that it's merely a parable trying to illustrate about hell. But here, here's the thing about that. I, number one, I believe that it's a true story. Jesus did not use the rich man's name, but he did use Lazarus' name. Uh, Jesus always said, the Bible always says, and he spake a parable unto them. It doesn't say that there. So I'm of the opinion, but I know that there are people who don't. I'm of the opinion that Luke 16 is true. I know that Mark, it's either Mark 9 or Mark 10. I think it's 10, but anyway. So let's think about hell for a minute, which, look, nobody likes to think about hell. It, it's a, a terrible place. The modernists say that hell is merely separation from God, uh, that there is no fire there, that hell is merely a place where people are held until the final judgment, and that people believe this, that at the final judgment, the wicked will be annihilated, and uh, that 
will not remember them. Well, we'll not remember them. That is true. But Jesus said on the cross, I think there were seven things he said. One thing he said was this, I thirst. Secondly, he said, another thing he said was, uh, forgive them for they know not what they do. And thirdly, he said this, he said seven things, but the third thing that I'm, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So when Jesus was on the cross, he suffered physically, he suffered emotionally, he suffered mental, uh, spiritually. In Luke 16, that guy said, Abraham, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Now, you'll note what it says. The rich man also died and in torments. It's plural. Torments. All right, so we would expect more than one. So number one, he was physically tormented in a flame. And Mark 10 or Mark 9 says this, where the fire is never quenched. All right, so hell is a place of fire. Now, I, look, I know that there are people who, they don't believe that, but I, I'm just a poor, ignorant preacher that reads the Bible, and, and, you know, that's what I read, that hell's a place of fire. The Bible says in Revelation, and I know it's not talking about hell, but it's talking about the lake of fire, it says the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. So, for the sake of argument, and it's not even an argument. Let us suggest that after a million years, God will let people out of hell. Now, he's not going to. He, he won't do that. Because if that were the case, then the death of Christ was for no reason. Because after a million years, he's going to let everybody out of hell. But it is a place of eternal, uh, physical uh, torment. I also know this, it's called the bottomless pit. I think that people have the sensation in hell of constantly falling and constantly falling away from the only thing that would help them, and that is God. So, number one, the Bible describes it as physically tormented. I don't know if you've ever been burned. I'm not talking about, ooh, that's hot. I'm not talking about that kind of burn. I'm talking, I'm talking about second and three degree burns uh, where you blister. Um, twice that happened to me. You know, I joke about it, but it's like, you know, that thing closed cover before striking on the matchbook. There's a reason they put that on there. I struck it when I reached, it lit every one of the matches and it, I got a huge blister burn from that but not going into the reason but another time I got a hot iron set on my hand you know it's that kind of iron it got set on my hand not once but twice to the point that these three fingers were I'm telling you that being burned is no fun and the idea of, and, and I've heard what BJ said that man, when people go to hell, they wind up there, and ah, we're going to have a big party, we'll play cards and all that kind of stuff. Not only is it a place where, of, of physical fire and a sense of falling, but it's also called uh, outer darkness. It is like, um, you ever, ever so dark, you know, you try to see your hand in the dark, you can't see it, it's that dark. Well, that's what hell will be like. You won't, you won't, you say, well, I'll see my friends. No, you won't see your friends. You may hear people because the Bible says there is weeping and wailing and grinding, gnashing of teeth. You'll hear people screaming. You probably won't see them. Uh, but it is a place, the Bible says in Luke 16, of, of physical torment. But not only that, people in hell will remember he said to him, son, remember. And Jesus said in Mark 10, where the worm, which means conscience, your conscience does not die in hell. 
people will remember. I've talked to many, many people in my life. One guy I, I, I remember, and I've, I've shared this with you, he lived over there in Kelpie Town. I stopped at his house. I forget who I was with, witness to the guy. Talked, I, I believe it was Gil Martin that was with me. Gil Martin was with me that night. And talked to that guy. And then at the end, I said, sir, would you like to be saved? Talked to him for half an hour. I said, sir, would you like to be saved? No. He, he just said flat out, no, I don't want to be saved. I said, do you understand what I'm saying to you? Yes. I said, you understand if you don't, get, if you don't trust Christ. I understand it. I don't want to get saved. He died in about six months. In hell, people will remember. Because he said, Abraham said to the rich man, Son, remember. Jesus said, the conscience does not die in hell. That people will remember. They'll probably remember you. If, if yes, ma'am. Uh, friends that we recently were saved, the first question she says to me is, do you really believe there's a heaven? And it's like they're not being taught either to be true. Right. And so you have to speak to the point there is a heaven. There's a reason you want to go to heaven and the glorious of it. And people just aren't being taught either either right. direction. If, if you knocked on somebody's door, you, you know, Joe Smith, and you know, you're a sinner. They'll look at you like, what's a sinner? How, what is a sinner? And you almost have to start at the Garden of Eden and try to explain things. But it's like, it's like she said, and it's like Deb said, that girl said, I don't believe anything. And people today do not believe in anything. They, if I, when I die, they're just going to put me in the ground. That's all it's going to be. They'll just put me in the ground. And it, how many remember uh, the worms crawl in, the worms crawl out, the worms play pinochle on my, when you die? Anybody remember that one? Yeah, when your kids, stupid. But anyway, you know. Uh, but, and that's the way a lot of people think. Ah, when I die, you know, I'll just be fodder for the, Worms. Well, I've read several missionary stories, and uh, they, when they go into a, like a foreign country where there's natives that right. they've never heard, they start with creation. Right. And that's almost to the point now where you have to, because you talk, uh, I, I, I was in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and we were in downtown witnessing to people, and I asked a teenager, this was like when we first got married in like 1974. I said, do you know who Jesus is? He said, no, I have no idea who Jesus is. He said, I re remember reading about him in a history book, but that's all I know about him. And you say, well, that's sad, preacher. It is. It's sad and it's tragic because, uh, you know, Jesus? no, I don't know who he is. He's the son of God. Well, what does that mean, the son of God? I have no, they have no frame of reference. And so you almost have to start at the very beginning. So Luke 16 says he was in a physical torment. He said, I am tormented in this flame. He was in an e emotional, because he said, he said, Abraham, send Lazarus back because I've got five brothers that are coming to this God-awful place. So he was in an emotional torment. Again, Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So emotionally, he said, I, I, want, I, don't want, I don't want anybody to come to this place. And if we think about it, and we don't, we don't like thinking about hell. It's a horrible place. We don't even like thinking about it. It's just horrible. But again, it's because, you know, we're brought up in a, in a culture in which we believe the Bible to be true. If it's like... Um, uh, it's like Royce. Uh, you still a Yankee fan? That's a shame. Um, it's like, I, I say to him, 
You know, there are other baseball teams. No, they're not. There's only one. The Yankees. Uh, and trying to convince him, all he ever saw was the Yankees. That's all he ever saw. He never saw anything else. So we're, we're brought up in church to believe the Bible. And our, our sole rule of faith is the Bible. Everything that we believe is found in the Bible. And you try to talk to a, a person who's never been brought up in that. What's the Bible? You know, and the first question, there, how do you know the Bible's true? How do you know the, I've had people, how do you know the Bible's true? You know, Jesus said this, that if any man desires to know the truth, he shall know it. How do you know the Bible is true? Um, there are several reasons we're not going to go into those today. Uh, but how do you know there is a heaven? Why would you want to go to heaven? What, let me ask you, what is most people's conception of heaven? What, what is most people's idea of heaven? Huh? Exactly. I'm a pu I'm, I am a published writer. I'll be in the Loudville Journal. Where did you get the Loudville Journal? Journal. Did you already get it? Oh, no, it, uh, it'll be in this week's. It'll be in this week's. So I, I, I wrote my, my whole articles on heaven. And the first thing, what do people think? People on clouds playing harps. Well, who wants to do that forever? You know? And it, people's, mis people's idea of heaven is so misconstrued. They, so I'm only asking... What is your idea about heaven? What's your... Lou, I'm going to ask you, Lou. You're right here in the front, and I'm on this side today. What's your idea about... What do you think heaven's about? Like? Well, going to woods. Going to woods all day. No, I, I think uh, there's no pain. There's no, uh, no tears, uh, no regrets. Um, you'll be worshiping the Lord and uh, okay. singing His praises. Okay. And... If I said that, and most people, that would be their idea of heaven. Uh, Revelation 21, 4 said, uh, for the former things are passed away. No death, no sorrow, no crying, no more tears. Uh, no more cancer, no more heart attacks, no more cataracts, no more deafness, no more anything in heaven. I, uh, John said, I saw the new heaven. I saw the new Jerusalem descending out of heaven. And again, we've made this comment. I'm, I, I cannot tell you, and six guys will say this, six guys will say the other. The, have, have, the new Jerusalem will hover above the earth. The other six guys say, no, the new Jerusalem will be on the earth. The Bible doesn't exactly tell us, but I saw a new heaven and a new earth. If you get a new car, I've said this, if you get a new car, still got a steering wheel, still got a motor, Still got wheels, still got seats, but it's new. But it's a car. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I, I believe the new earth, well, there'll be no more sea, the Bible says, but I believe it's going to be the earth. I believe God's going to recreate it. That's why I think there's going to be coffee in heaven in, in, on the new earth. Huh? Well, we like sleep and just get up in the morning and do things and... Well, frolic in the flowers or whatnot. <laughs> okay, moving on. No, all right, look, look. You want to know the answer to that? Yes. Because I believe that it will be like when Adam and Eve were here. And God said, look, oh, he, 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 got, he told Adam two things. Tend to the garden and take care of your wife. Okay, all right. Okay, so now we're getting into uh, here. Okay, somebody said, I don't know. The Bible says there'll be no sun there because there'll be no night, but that's talking about the new Jerusalem. So, I, I, and it is obvious, I've said this, it is obvious that they mark time in heaven because during the tribulation they say, How long, O Lord? 
uh, faithful and true. Dost thou not avenge our blood? So how long indicates there is some time, kind of marking of time. And he said for a season. So there, there's got to be. But will we sleep? Will we eat? Yeah. Will we sleep? I'll tell you when I get there. But, uh, you know, it's like, uh, so back to BJ's original, huh? BJ's original question. Look, I believe heaven is going to be beyond our wildest imaginations. I believe that. I mean, it's just going to be. So, BJ's question, Luke 16, it's not a parable because Jesus says it's not a parable. Jesus did not use the rich man's name. He used Lazarus' name. My opinion, and this, you know, you hear guys say this, the reason he didn't use his name was he probably would have been a well-known person, so he didn't. So then the third thing, one, he was in a physical torment. He said, I am tormented, tormented in this flame. He was an emotional because he could remember. He remembered his five brothers who were coming there. He remembered that. And then thirdly, this, there's spiritual, because Abraham said there's a great gulf fixed between us. So he's, if you wanted to come home, if Lazarus wanted to come home, he can't because there is a gulf fixed there's a separation between the just and the unjust. That people in hell, you know, I said people are, have a sense of falling. I think they have a sense of falling away from the only thing that would ever help them, and that is God. And it is called the bottomless pit. It is outer darkness. And so when Jesus was on the cross, he suffered those three things, emotional, spiritual, and physical. Jesus suffered our hell for us. He paid our sin debt. So Luke chapter 9 or 10 at the end of the chapter, anybody have that Luke 9 or 10 where it says where the worm dieth not? It might be at the end of, of Luke 10 or Luke 9. I mean, I'm sorry, Mark, 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 Mark 10 or Mark 9. Uh, three times Jesus says there where the fire is not quenched. Mark 9, 44. Jesus says three times. The fire is not quenched. And the worm, worm is just an old English word for conscience, where the fire is not quenched and people remember. They'll, they'll remember you. That guy I spoke about that said, no, I don't want to get saved. No, I don't want to get saved. Yeah, I understand I need to get saved. And he didn't want to get saved. He remembers. He remembers. Now, People have said, well, will we remember in heaven? I, okay, God's going to wipe away all tears from our eyes. I, I, you know, we can't explain. Look, there's a thousand and seven years at least of history left. And the Bible doesn't give us a great deal of detail. But at the end, there's a great right, there is a great white throne in which the dead, that group of people who are spiritually dead, will be judged. Now, we won't be judged because our sins were judged at Calvary. And when we trusted Christ, you know, people will say, well, preacher, do you think we'll be there? Do you think we'll see people that we have known? Depart from me, for I never knew you. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Preacher, do you think we'll be there? Preacher, do you think that we'll see people that we've known and loved and cared about in this life? Do you think we'll see that? I don't know. I, can't, I cannot tell you. I can tell you this, that Revelation 20 comes before Revelation 21. And in Revelation 21, it says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. We will not remember these people in eternity. We, we won't. Yes, ma'am. It's repeated three times. Yes. And that really shows the emphasis of it. <laughs> right. You know, when it's repeated so much like that. Right. But then could you explain the rest of that, that chapter and that what the salt is and how it impacts us? It says we are... Salt is good, but I don't understand. All right, look at Mark 9. 
Mark chapter 9. Oh, let's see. All right. BJ, I do not know if that answered your question, but the clearest uh, extended explanation is Luke 16. He was in torments, it says, at the very beginning, plural. So he was in physical, he was in emotional, he was in spiritual. And Mark chapter 9, where we are now, if you'll notice in verse... 42, and whosoever shall offend him, we talked about this, what does it mean to cut your hand or your foot off? But it says, and whosoever shall offend one of these little ones. You'll remember that they brought little children to Jesus, and the disciples said, we don't have time for them. And Jesus got really mad with them. Really mad. Jesus loves the little children. He took them up in his arms and he blessed them. But it says, so if we offend a little one, better if a millstone were hanged about our neck and he were cast into the sea, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. We, we spoke about that, uh, then having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that, shall notice, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Now, look, I know that there are people. I know there are people. I know there are people who say they believe the Bible. Say, well, hell doesn't have fire in it. Mm, that isn't what it says in verse 43, verse 45, and verse 48. The fire is not quenched. All right. Now, so Connie wants to know why, what's the rest of this about? Notice what it says there. I'll read it. Uh, For everyone that shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with fire. Salt is good, but a salt of lost saltiness wherewith will you season it. Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. Okay, so, you know, the question is, like, uh, what's that supposed to mean? All right, you need to understand that in the Bible, in the Bible, not, not everything, you, you'll find that, those two verses, and similar to that in other portions of Scripture. I'm positive that what it says at the end of Luke 9 doesn't appear in any other Gospels, only in Luke, or in Mark chapter 9, about the fire and the worm. So, the Gospels are not a biography of Christ's life. They, you'll read things in one place. Have to, for example, the disciples were arguing with one another. One time it says they were arguing when they walked in the way. Jesus said, Why, what did you argue about? Another time they were someplace else when that conversation. Again, so... Why did Mark put those two verses at the end of that section? First of all, I don't know. But I know that all Scripture is given, and so it's there for a reason. But I, I'm not... Okay, I'm just, I'll am just say this. He put it there. I don't know why he put it there. I don't think it has anything to do with those verses that are in front of it. So when we read it then, this, that in verse 49... For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with fire. Well, we don't, you don't do sacrifices anymore. What is salt for? Well, there are a lot of things. One, it preserves. One, it, it, it heals. Salt heals. Anybody ever dump salt on a cut? Anybody ever do that? Nobody ever did? Did it hurt? Yeah, it hurts. Uh, but, you know, you put salt on stuff to preserve. I said one time, my in-laws, they don't eat ham. They don't eat ham. They don't. But I was coming, so they bought a salted ham. Oh, somebody gave it to them. Okay, they wouldn't buy it. Well, they wouldn't buy it. But anyway, somebody gave them a salted ham. Now, if you know anything about salted hams, you've got to soak that in cold water for a while. They cooked it. They didn't, they didn't soak it. 
We took one bite of that. Man, we threw the thing away. It wasn't any good. So salt's good for preservative. Uh, BJ, you want to say something? There, Go ahead. Line actually says, for every one shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Right. You said fire twice. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, so let's make fun of the preacher, you know, okay. No, that's all right. That's fine. Um, so, yeah. So, so when we read verse 49, verse 50, all right, so what's, the, what's Jesus trying to get across to us? Verse 50 is salt is good, but has lost its saltiness, wherewith shall you season it? Jesus said in another place, it's good for nothing but to be cast out underfoot. Salt was very valuable in, in Bible times. People were paid in salt. We get that expression, he's not worth his salt. Uh, people were paid in salt because it's very precious. So when we read in verse 50, salt is good. It is good. I don't like a lot of salt. My wife, she just... You know, um, I don't like salt except on green beans. I like salt on that. Maybe French fries. And eh, maybe hamburgers. Too. But anyway, so I was like, um, so salt is good. But if the salt has lost the saltiness, you know, and I, I appreciate the fact, I appreciate the fact what BJ said. I appreciate that one of the people that folks have visited last week John bugged them to come. And the guy said to me, I'm glad John, you know, bugged me to come. Do you have any saltiness about you? It's, it's a preservative. It's a, it'll, it'll heal. Uh, it'll add some spice to your food. Uh, you know, you, that kind of thing. So salt is good. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. That's what we are. We are the salt. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, not any good. He said, I believe in Matthew, same idea. He said in Matthew, it's, it's not any good but to be thrown out and, and men to walk on it. And so the Bible encourages us to keep our salt. We sing this little light of mine. He, Jesus is talking about salt. He's talking about light in Matthew. I believe it's seven or five. He's talking about light and salt, or we just call it lalt. You know, combine that word together. And uh, but if you lost your saltiness, wherewith will you season it? It's no good. It's just absolutely no more good. And so Jesus encourages to be salty. I'm not sure why. I cannot tell you why. Those two verses came at the end of that that word. Because Jesus is talking about hell. And then all of a sudden, it's like he changes. But if you, when you read the Gospels, that happens a lot. Uh, there are just things that happen. When you, when you read about the end of, uh, at the end, uh, after the raising of Lazarus, Jesus went into the wilderness. Then he went over to Jericho. When he went into Jericho, Okay, so he meets Zacchaeus. One of them says he met the blind men going into Jericho. Another one says he met them coming out of Jericho. You say, well, is that a mistake? Well, no, because I don't think the Bible has mistakes, and I believe that's easily explainable. But, but there are just things that you read to say, well, when you compare it to one of the other Gospels, it doesn't come in the same place. And I believe that's what this case is. So the Bible is encourage, encouraging us to be salty, to have some salt about us. You know that when people see us, people know us. Somebody wrote, wrote this, not original with me. If you were taken into a court of law, would there be enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? Would there be enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? So I just... Have some saltiness about us. I don't think we have to be obnoxious. But, you know, there ought to be something different about it. I've said many times, lost people do what lost people do. That's what lost people do. Does it bother me? Well, sure it bothers me. But I can tell you this about Jesus. 
He was around lost people every single day. Don't you think he heard them cursing? Yeah. Don't you think he saw the life? That, yeah. My brother will have nothing to do. He said, I, I don't want anything to do with lost people. I have lots of people that I know rather well that are lost. Never going to reach them. You'll never reach them by saying, I am better than you. You know that person who said, I never came to your church because I only thought good people went there. Nah, the worst sinners in Lewis County come here. I'll tell you that right now because I know them. But saved by grace on our way to heaven. Uh, so that's what, I, that's what I believe that's talking about. Anybody else? We got about five minutes left. Anybody else got a question, comment, thought? Somebody. Good. Lou. Uh, I've often thought, in, I mean, in heaven, uh, we will have, we'll be given work, not work that'll be drudge type work, right. but work to improve ourselves or to improve some situation. Um, learn to praise God by music or something like that. You learn, learn things right. or learn uh, to speak uh, the original Hebrew, you know, whatever. I, I heard one guy say this. I don't know where he came up with it. He thinks the original language was Hebrew. I don't, I don't know that. Um, Jimmy DeYoung, that's who I heard say that. Uh, to answer your question, the Bible says, and they serve him. They serve him. So, will we, will, I think it will be like the Garden of Eden. When God said to Adam, take care of the garden. Yeah, dress the garden. How tough could that be? There weren't any weeds. Uh, and it was, huh? It meant there were no weeds in the Garden of Eden. So, what did he do? Well, I just probably went around and straightened the flowers up. And, yeah, naming the animals. This may sound far-fetched, but you know, people, you think there were dinosaurs when Adam was there. Well, I, if I believe the Bible to be true, of course I do. Uh, you, you think animal wrote, I mean, you think Adam, you know, had elephant races with Eve? Well, I don't know. Maybe he did. I don't know. Did he ride a dinosaur? I don't know. But, you know, you said before when I asked you what your idea of heaven was, I wasn't trying to put you on the spot, but... You know, in heaven, I, I, I believe that we will all, in the new earth, have a purpose. Just like now. I said last week, I'll say it again. God did not make you and then try to come up with an idea for you to do something. God had a plan, and so he created you to fulfill that purpose. I've said many times. You know, when I prayed and I said, God, I'd like to live somewhere where it snowed in the winter. I know. I, I, say, I know God has a sense of humor because he put me here where it snows. But I believe beyond any shadow of a doubt that God made me to fulfill the purpose of being the preacher here. I believe that. Um, God made you to fulfill the purpose of Connie needed somebody in her life that was strong, stable, and a good shot. You know, I, that's, and so he made Lou. He made Lou. Uh, I've said many times, I probably would have quit many times if I hadn't been for my wife. Um, on Sunday night in 1966 or 7, 1966 or 7, I don't know when it was. I was standing in the back of the church, usually where I sit in the seat of the scornful, uh, there in the back, and church was over, and she came walking down the aisle with her father and mother. You say, well, well that was a coincidence. Nope. I don't think that's so with, with God. God has a purpose, God has a plan, and eternity, that plan will be, will be uh, 
drawn out for us. So uh, anyway, okay. Uh, all right, very good. All right, I believe Miss Fitzgerald has something for you. All right, so anyway, okay. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again, Lord, for your goodness today. Lord, I thank you for the questions. Lord, we don't like thinking about hell. But Lord, it's a real place. You said it's a real place. And Lord, I, I know most people don't get the idea, don't get the conception of it today. Heaven. People don't, well, is there really a heaven? Do people really go there? Are they there now? Are there really people in hell? Are they really there? Lord, help us to rightly divide the word of truth. Sometimes, sometimes it's hard, Lord. There are things that we just, it's hard to grasp and understand. Well, Lord, we're thankful today for your word. And Lord, we think about heaven, where our loved ones are today. They are in heaven. They are waiting for us. They're waiting for us to cross over to the other side. Oh, Father, how we thank you again for your goodness to us and your mercy. Lord, thank you for heaven. Thank you, Lord, that has provided free of charge. It's a free gift. That eternal life is through your son, Jesus. And we thank you for that. Now, Lord, bless, we pray, in our next hour. Lord, bless our dinner today and Lord's table today. Lord, just bless the rest of our day. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.